everyone to the third round of talks for today. Um, today we're going to be hearing from Antonio, uh, who's one of the core developers for PyPy, mm -hmm. and he's going to be talking about test-driven development. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you and uh, good morning to everyone. So, well, before we start, uh, I wanted to just uh, tell some words about uh, me. I have been, as, as it has been said, I am a PyPy developer for more than 10 years now. I'm also the author of some uh, libraries uh, and uh, modules around in the PyPy, in the Python ecosystem. You can find me on Twitter and on my, on my website. Uh, why I wanted to tell this is because in all these projects which I uh, written here in the slide, um, all of these projects are very um, well tested. And uh, PyPy in particular is the project which taught me how to approach test-driven development, how to write tests and what is the, cor the, the correct um, mindset to to be effective in, uh, in doing this. So I wanted to just share a, uh, a bit uh, of my experience in this. So what about you? Well, I written this talk with having in mind uh, uh, novice programmers, which are uh, maybe new to Python, uh, and uh, they, yes, they always hear about testing and uh, whatever, but they don't really know exactly what, what it means in practice, but also, maybe experienced programmer who, who already know how to program for uh, years and years, but uh, maybe, uh, again, they, they are new to Python and Python ecosystem, and, uh, or maybe they just never did uh, any proper test-driven development. So how many of you do test-driven development daily? Cool. So yes, you are the right audience. <laughs> Yes, this talk is divided mostly into two parts. Uh, fir first, I will try to, uh, to detail some general principles uh, uh, of test-driven development, how to approach it. And then I, I also want to show like a list of useful patterns and tips. I'm, I don't know if I will have enough time for showing everything because, well, it's an endless job, basically. I can continue forever and forever, and, uh, but yes, I will try to to the best of the time I have. But first, a disclaimer, because actually when I thought about this talk, I wanted to show more and more concrete examples of code and how to do and what not to do. And, but, well, I, d I didn't have time to prepare it before flying to South Africa, which happened one week ago. And I said, yes, I do it while I'm here. But then, well, then I went here. <laughs> <laughs> then I also went there. Then I, I, we even managed to uh, go up to Table Mountain and do a PyPy commit while on Table Mountain <laughs> and uh, we wanted to take a picture of it. So yes, the talk is less detailed than I, I wanted. And yesterday I said, yes, I can prepare it and finish it the night before it, but then this happened. <laughs> so yes, anyway, let's start for... So what is the goal of testing? Uh, yes, you write your code, and yes, everybody tells you to write tests, right? So the goal of testing is to make sure that your code works well. Do you agree? Well, you should. Yes. No. Well, of course, it's obvious. Actually, the, the actual point of test-driven development is, no, is to make sure that your code does not break. Because yes, uh, w w when, we, when we write something, yes, maybe we, we try it uh, uh, manually or something, and yes, it works, and then we commit and we are happy. But one month later, or one week later, or maybe two minutes later, we do something else, and, uh, and what we wrote earlier, well, it stops working, and maybe we don't even notice. I mean, this is what, what happens when you do like manual testing. Uh, if any programmer knows about it. You, you write the code and you try and, uh, and etc. Maybe your application is complex, so you're like web application, you open the browser, you go there, you click some buttons, you check that everybody looks fine and etc. You're happy until, well, until it works actually. Then you start doing another feature, we modify the code, you're happy again, but then, well, the feature A no longer works, but 
you don't know because, well, you should repeat again all the steps you did before, but you don't because you're lazy, we are all lazy, we know, yes. And uh, so what is the point of test-driven development is to write automatic uh, tests in which instead of testing it manually and checking manually that things work, you write a small program which, uh, which checks for you that the code is correct. And, uh, and the point is that uh, you, you run it by, by, by using a test runner which does all the mm, boring things for you. And, and then yes, th then it means that while you develop feature A, you write the test for feature A, when you, you, you develop feature B, you run the test again, but then uh, before committing, you just run all the tests, so well, you discover immediately that you broke something and you can fix it. So everybody is happy and that's, that's basically the, the idea. Uh, well, yes, everything is good, but well, the point is that, yes, you need to write the test. And, uh, and this is where, if you are lazy, maybe you just don't because, hey, I'm sure that I will, uh, won't break it and etc. No, yes, you, you I it's really a state of mind. For af after a while that you get used to it, you really feel uh, um, bad for committing something which doesn't have a corresponding test. Because you know by experience, uh, uh, after you do it one, two, three times that, yes, then the code breaks and maybe I should have written the test. So basically, trust me, start with this mindset and you, you will be happy. There is nothing particularly hard to writing tests, it's just a program. and. Uh, if you use the right frameworks and tools, it, it's even easier. Uh, there are a lot of them in the Python ecosystem. I wrote a couple of them. I, I'm really a big fan of PyTest. I have been using it for all my projects for 10 years and it works very well, so I, I can just recommend it. If you don't know where to start, well, try it and uh, you will be happy, basically. All the, all the other are, are also fine. Um, I don't, I, don't, I don't care what tool you, you use as long as you write tests. Uh, so again, uh, the goal of test-driven development is to make sure that your code does not break. And uh, we also have uh, this uh, way of saying that it's what is not tested is broken. I mean, maybe it's not broken right now, but eventually it will be. So really make sure that all your code, uh, especially the important part, are tested so that you can be sure that it works. And uh, the core principle of test-driven development is that you should write the test first. So you, well, you, 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 so you, you, you cannot just not write it. Um, why, why it happens? Because well, wh when you start to, to, to develop, it's easy, you write the code and then you write the test and etc. But sometimes it happens that you get a bug report, so you want a uh, fix. So what you do, you, 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 you fix your, your program and then uh, um, you write the test to check that the, the program has been fixed and you're happy because the test passes. But it, it happens a lot of time that maybe the test passed anyway, even before your fix. So it means that yes, you wrote a new test, but it's not a test for your fix. So the, the, the idea is that you, run the te you write the test, you check that it fails, and then you, you write the fix and you check that it passes. So you, you are be you're sure that the test you have written is for the bug fix you did. And uh, again, after a while of experience and after being beaten by, by this mistake uh, a lot of time, then you really become scared. I mean, nowadays when we write a test in PyPy, it happens that yes, you, you see it fails, you, you, you make the fix, you see it passes, and then you, you comment out the fix and you check again that it fails because, well, it happens that sometimes uh, you, you take another code path and etc. You really want to be sure. And also, it's, it's important that each test must, must run in isolation in the sense that maybe if you have a, long, uh, a test suite which takes a long time, and uh, um, so you don't, don't feel like running all the tests together, so uh, like for example with PyTest you have commands to select only one particular test and, uh, and, and it works. But you need to take special care to write tests in such a way that they don't depend on the state which was modified by the previous one. So ba basically all the tests should uh, 
should pass either when you run them in isolation alone or together with all the other and which means usually you try you should try hard not to modify or rely on global states like uh, global variables that you modified or uh, modules which are already being imported or, or not. One nice thing that you get when, uh, when you follow this approach and you, you follow it really uh, um, deeply is that basically in, in your uh, workflow what happens is that you, you write the test and you write the, the fix or the new feature and you commit both together and um, you should try hard not to commit things if they break the tests. So it, it is ensured that your code base is always uh, in a clean state. Sometimes it happens that after two days of development you realize that uh, one test is broken, but then if you have all your, or, or, all your tests written correctly, you can just uh, use the tools uh, which are provided by the VCS control system like Mercury or Git and you can bisect it. Basically you, you can tell uh, Git, uh, uh, I'm sure that in at this point in the my commit history this test worked, now I see that this test no longer works, please run this command and, and to check, uh, uh, to run the test and see if it fails or not and then it, it, it does it automatically does a bisection and so it finds exactly the commit which broke the test. So you can see what happened and then, well, you can probably fix it. So it's, it's really useful and uh, I it's alone uh, one, um, one thing to, to, to do, be, be a nice thing to have uh, while, uh, while you write the tests. So what are the benefits of, do of having this kind of approach? Well, to start with, we, we, you you have a better confidence that your code is a good quality and it works and etc. It's very easy to foster regression, which is this feature which nobody uses because, uh, well, almost nobody, but only some user in some case and etc. Uh, yes, it, you see it immediately that it's broken because the test fails. And uh, if somehow uh, this regression is introduced, you can anyway go, go back in time and see which, which is the commit which introduced it and uh, who wrote it and wha what it had in mind and etc. So you can uh, do this kind of stuff. And also, most importantly, it gives you the power of removing code freely. It happens sometimes that you refactor and you see that there is a branch of a if which seems to be never taken and contains 100 lines of code and you say, well, should I throw it away or not? Uh, you are not sure because you don't know maybe sometimes it it uh, is taken or not but if your code is well tested you can just remove it run the test and see if anything breaks if it doesn't well cool you you, you improved your your code uh, base because removing code is always a good idea unless the code does something important of course so this gives you the power of refactoring it, it also gives you the power of well, refactoring things uh, shuffling things around uh, moving uh, uh, modules uh, um, moving these two methods in another class and etc., and you you still be are sure that you are still sure that your code works and nobody uh, nothing broke. So what are the properties of a good test? I'm yes, I'm saying look like blah blah blah. Let's try to <laughs> to, to be a more a bit more concrete. So as I said, it should fail before uh, you write the fix. It should be deterministic in the sense that uh, it should never. Uh, if a test fails every other time uh, or uh, once in a while depending on the phase of the moon then it's not a good test you should really try hard to make it det uh, deterministic for example uh, one thing that hits bite people uh, uh, often in python is the order of things inside a dictionary so maybe you your test at some point produce a dictionary you check that the keys of the dictionaries are a b c but sometimes the keys for some reason are in another order because the dictionary is unordered. So you write the test and by writing, well, let's take the keys, sort them, so I, I, I am sure that now in are in this particular order and things like this. And most importantly, a test should be easy to read because yes, you write it, fine, but eventually you will have to read it and to, um, 
or you or someone else and to understand again what, what was this about because, well, it pa uh, time passed and you, do, you did, don't remember. So what about readability? I, I think that when you write a test, it should really tell a story. Um, uh, like, I want to go from point A to point B, kind of straight, and uh, so you should write your test in the way that every test tests only one feature. You should try to avoid complex control flow inside the test code itself, because else it, it, it becomes a mess to, to understand it, and, uh, and you risk that your test is more complex than your code, and so it's not, 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 a good, uh, not a good idea. And also, you should try to write it in a way that if it fails, well, it should be obvious why it failed, or at least it should be obvious what, what it should have happened. Sometimes uh, I, I see tests uh, which like take this blob of binary data and uh, check that it produces this blob of binary data. I yes, thank you, but if it fails, I have no idea what happened. So you should try to to write it in a way that when it fails, maybe you write a comment. I, I, I expect this to be that because it isn't that. So for example, this is an example of a bad test for testing uh, like a very uh, simple uh, function for uh, computing a factorial. Why this is bad? Well, because uh, there is some kind of complex control flow. There are two nested loop and etc. And basically, the problem of this kind of test is that it's re-implementing the function I'm testing. <laughs> and uh, yes, I mean, uh, I'm a programmer, and uh, they everybody told me that I should try to avoid repetition and etc. and try to be smart. So yes, this is a smart way to check for if for the factorial result, but it's not it's not uh, good because if I if a test fails, then I have to understand again what 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 it was doing. And most importantly, maybe I just I'm just doing some error in uh, in the logic of the test itself, and maybe I did the very same error in the in the code which I'm testing. So the test passes, but the code is buggy. And actually, this 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 really happens because while I was <laughs> writing this presentation, I I I, <laughs> I made a mistake in writing the test, and so I got a tease, <laughs> which well, uh, be because I forgot uh, to to add the one here in the in the range basically. But yes. So I fixed the test, and but this really doesn't work. A better solution for uh, testing the factorial is writing something like this. So you pre-compute your value, like by hand, and uh, and you check that these two calls gives the the result. This is already much better because if it fails, at, at least I, I see which line is failing, that and I see what what is the value I expected and uh, what is the value I get. So yes. But uh, uh, an even better way from my point of view, is writing like this. This really tells a story and, it's and it makes it obvious what happens. I mean, if you, write, if you don't know exactly what the factorial does, but you read this code, well, you, you see that it should, be, uh, it should compute this value or that value. So whenever you get a failure, well, I it's also obvious what, what happened. So uh, of course, this is a very simple example and we can um, Maybe it's not so uh, so important to write it one way or the other, but the general idea is this one. Your test should also teach you about the logic that you expect from your program. So first, tests should be easy to read. Second, it should be easy to write. Why? Well, because we are programmers, so by definition we are lazy. and. Uh, and so since we are lazy, sometimes it happens that we are uh, in a hurry and we want to write this feature or to fix this bug because the boss is uh, angry at us and, and etc. So if the test is hard to write and takes time and etc., maybe, well, I don't feel like, so yes, nobody will notice and etc. But if, if you have an infrastructure in su written in such a way that makes the test easier to write, uh, and uh, th then it's more likely that you will do it and uh, and you will enjoy doing it, and maybe it will make right, uh, the, 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 the resulting test easier to read, so back to the, to the other property. So it happens, to me it happens a lot that I invest, uh, depending on the project, I invest a lot of time in writing a proper test infrastructure, and then I will show you some example of what I mean, and, uh, and then uh, the infrastructure uh, well, it contains some complex logic, so I need to test it as well. 
But yes, that's, that's fine. And then once I have it in, in place, I can start to write the test in a, in a really beautiful way. So for example, this is a, uh, well, this is a simplified example, but from it's actual code from, uh, mm, well, it's not the actual code, it's simplified code, but the, the idea is, uh, is in PyPy uh, for real. We have uh, some test in PyPy which tries to uh, run the PyPy executable and check that it computes the, the correct result, and, uh, and also they, 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 they check that uh, the JIT compiler produces this ki some kind of code which we expect and etc. but forget about this part for now. So one way of doing it is like uh, I write the Python code of the co uh, the, that I want to, to execute on PyPy, uh, I run a sub-process of it, and uh, like for example in, 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 this, uh, in this logic I pass the input of the, of, of, the, uh, of the function as an argument from the command line, I have some code which parses the command line, calls the function I want to actually run, prints it back to standard output, and, and then I parse again the standard output, so I can check that the factorial function executed on PyPy computed the right result. But Yes, this is a, uh, it's a test, it's good to have, and, uh, but uh, you see that if you, when you read it, uh, you it's not immediately obvious what it does and what you are checking because, well, there are a lot of boilerplate, and also, next time you want to, to write another function and, and test it, uh, well, you have to, to rewrite the boilerplate again and etc. so no, that's, that, that, that's, this is not easy to write. You have to maybe copy and paste, the copy is always bad. <laughs> So a better way, but still bad, like we factor out some of the logic to call the sub-process sub and to do the parsing of the argument and etc. So we have this function, which is our infrastructure. We, um, we write the test like this, which is a bit smaller than, than earlier, and we call the function to execute. So next time we want to, to write another test, well, it's, it's a bit easier, so we are good. But there is an even better way, which is really a proper test infrastructure, and this is really something which, which we have in PyPy, and uh, I think I even wrote it, or well, I, don't know, I don't know if it was me or someone else, but it's not important. So we, we have this base class, we write the test inside the base class, we write our nice function, nice, mm, function in Python, and then we have the special run function, which does all, uh, all the logic automatically for me. So it, it, uh, it takes the source code of the inner function, it writes it to, to some file uh, with the boilerplate, it executes it, and etc., and it returns me an already parsed uh, file. So to write the test now, it's very, very easy. I just write the Python function and tell it to run it with this argument and I check the result. You can clearly see that writing the test now is a breeze. I mean, you just type the function and call it and you're happy without all the boilerplate. For completeness, this is uh, the implementation of the PyPy test based class, but the, 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 the point is that you write it once and then you, you can really write tons and tons of this test. And of course, a proper example would include also a test for the PyPy test class itself, but Basically, this is the, um, the, the general idea. And as I say, that this is a, a, a concrete example, and uh, you can find it in PyPy. You have uh, this uh, module here, which contains the, the, the logic for the infrastructure. It's, it's, more more co it's more complex than this. For example, it has support for uh, other types of uh, arguments. It has support for exceptions and, and et cetera. But and then you, you, you have the test which has all this nice feature, and then you have all the other tests in this directory which use the base class and, uh, and are much easier to follow than, uh, than this. And uh, another example of this kind of pattern is in CapNPy. CapNPy is another library which I wrote for uh, implementing CapNProto, which is a binary um, uh, format for exchanging messages. And uh, in, in CapNProto you have a schema file, so it happens that you have to compile it 
every time you want to, to get something. So what I, what I did was something that in which I can nicely write my schema inside the test, inside the like a doc string. And then uh, uh, when the test run, the schema is automatically being compiled and, uh, and I can just access the, uh, the generated classes. But, but the, the, the general idea is the same. I, 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 you write things in a way that lets you to write the test with as less boilerplate as possible. So this one was one of the patterns I wanted to show. Let's try another example. And this is good because it shows us that test-driven development also uh, brings us to a better design of our programs. And uh, in particular, if you follow some patterns, you end up with, uh, with a code base in which your components are nicely decoupled, which means that they, they, they depend on each other but are uh, written in uh, isolation, so you can test them in isolation and it's, it's easier because the logic is uh, smaller. And it's, 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 a, it's a pattern which is useful in general, but in particular it's useful for uh, graphical applications because uh, the graphical application, if they are not written in a good way, they tend to, to mix the logic for like computing the result and the logic for uh, uh, presenting the result to the user. So for example, before wh while I was um, pre pre preparing this uh, presentation, I googled Kinter tutorial to just find an example of GUI, and uh, and I found something like uh, like like here. I mean, you, I probably should have. Ah, yes, you you. One of the first results I got was this uh, this web page, which is nice, and uh, there is the example of the calculator in which. Well, basically, there is a class calculator which does a, uh, a couple of things. Like you have a label with, uh, with the which will uh, take a we show the result of the calculation. Uh, you have the total, which is the, the total you. I probably I can also show you. Probably it's easier. Let's go here. Is it good? Well, uh, of course, it's a very simple, but basically. Yes, you write like 10, you add it, and you get a total of 10, then you subtract 2, then you add 5, and etc. And, and then you reset and you get go back to 0, a very simple <coughs> thing. Oops. Yes. And, uh, but as you see, it's written in a way in which here we have it all the GUI code, and we also have the, the logic, because the total is the number which uh, we have computed so far, and when we call the update method, depending on which button we um, uh, we press it, uh, you well add or subtract from the total, and uh, and then you show it back to the user. This is very hard to to test because well you need a way to to do clicks and to to understand what is the the result and etc. In this particular example, it's very easy. Yes, the logic I can clearly see that it's correct, but think of more complex behavior, of course. So what I did to, to write a proper test for it is to extract the logic for the computation itself, the business logic, so I have a nice calculator class which does only the job without presenting to the user. So you have the total and you can add or sub or z, and that's it. And then uh, you can uh, write the test for the calculator, which is, well, I, I created a calculator and then I, I check that it starts at zero, then I add three and then the total is three, then I add five and eight, and that's, well that's obvious, I don't have to explain. And then I can write my GUI by reusing this calculator object here, and whenever I, 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 I click a button, I, I call the, the proper logic. And, and this is, well, this is just better than before because uh, I have a proper test, because my logic is, uh, d is decoupled, because I can think of writing a web uh, interface or a GUI interface to the same logic and I don't have to, to, to redo my work and etc. So, well, that this is an example of how writing, uh, writing your code with tests in mind leads you to, to a better design. A final example I want to to show is 
is how, po uh, how powerful is the, the, the notion of notation. Uh, I got the, the, the first time, years and years ago, I got this notion from was when I was reading this book, which if you don't know, I strongly suggest to read because it's just very, uh, very good um, collection of techniques and suggestion of how to program. You see the one of the author is this guy here, which who is the, 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 the same guy as the Kernighan and Ricci. I mean, the one of the two who invented the C. So, and uh, the point of the of the idea is that. Uh, Sometimes you write a code and yes, it's nice and it works and etc. But if you do a change of notation, for the human mind, it's much easier to to reason about these things. So uh, another example which we have in PyPy, at some point we need to test what the JIT does. So uh, we had the test which looked like this, like we have a list of operation of of, of the JIT and uh, the operation were written in this way, like. This is the merge point, which is this name, and contains this argument, and returns this, and this, and that. And we have we had tests which look like, yes, we have this list of operations, we do the optimization to, the, uh, to them, and then we, we check what is the output. But then, we wrote some powerful uh, uh, tool to change the notation of the test. So what we have now is something like here, like this, in which I don't have to manually create all the, all the classes and lists and etc. I can write the test in this uh, small uh, domain-specific language, in which it's obvious what it's, what, what it's, what it's doing, and then I can, uh, I can check that the expected uh, result is this one. Well, I don't, I don't want to go into the details of this particular test, but I mean, this is a test which is copied straight from, from PyPy. And, uh, and that's it, basically. Um, I, I, it's, it's more or less uh, the, same, uh, the, the same idea as uh, I explained uh, earlier when I was talking about uh, uh, to write an infrastructure to make a test easier to write. But this is a, like the, the a very good example of of it because th the tests now are very easy to read and to write and uh, and this is thanks to the change of notation so i think i'm done and uh, probably also in time so it's good that i had the beer yesterday so i didn't have i didn't add more uh, more slides and uh, you can find uh, the source code of the presentation and also the the small uh, examples at the this url uh, probably the slides will be available on the uh, on the conference website at some point. So, well, mm. and that's it. If you have question, we have ten seconds more, and then the question. Yes, <laughs> that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to open up the session for questions. Um, anyone? Okay. Uh, thanks for the chat. Um, how do you manage um, the fact that there are more developers? Do you write the test yourself or uh, and write the code, or is it another developer that writes the test and then the code? How do you get uh, this bias well problem? Well, this depends on the project. Uh, on PyPy, usually the the guy who writes the code is also the guy who writes the test. So. Y y if, if you want to do something, you write also the test. Uh, other projects are projects in which I work alone, so it's obviously me. Uh, there are people who suggest that the, people, the, the person who writes the test is another one, because in this way, I like for example, if you, if you have to read some specifications and uh, you there is an ambiguity, uh, there is a chance that Someone is testing something uh, because it, in a diff sorry, uh, the two guys uh, understand different things, so the test will fail because there is an ambiguity. But I never saw this applied in practice. So well, usually in my in my experience, you write that the the, the the person who writes the code is also the one who writes the test. Okay, thanks.
I just wanted to uh, ask you what your opinion is on using um, mock classes, and do you have any tips and tricks for us who choose to use them? Uh, right, yes, well, uh, this is something which is part of the, the, the slides which they didn't write, basically. <laughs> uh, yes, using mock, class, uh, mock uh, objects and uh, fake objects, which are slightly different things, uh, is, is a very good, uh, good idea. It's, it's also, um, well, uh, required uh, sometimes to, to write proper tests because if you go deeper in the, uh, in the example of the decoupling, then uh, at some point uh, you, you arrive uh, with a code base which contains a lot of components and you want to test them in isolation. But for example, you have, uh, you have the code which reads from the database and, uh, and does things and then saves to the database, but you don't want to use in the actual uh, a real database because it slows things down. So you write a fake database which exposes only the logic which you need for this particular component and maybe it doesn't even have, have to save them somewhere, just they keep them in memory. So in yes, I I it's something which comes natural when uh, you have your nicely decoupled the things. Uh, but yes, probably it uh, should, uh, should be, it would be easier to explain with an example, but, uh, but I don't, sorry. Blame the beer. Okay. So or, or Cape Town, I mean, <laughs> the beauty of Cape Town. Um, I think it actually just, um, my question relates uh, to what you've now mentioned with the database. So uh, I would say 89 to 95% of the, the Python code we write basically sit on top of a database. Um, some of this with raw select queries. Um, is there any projects or any suggestions apart from, uh, even how do you mock that? I've got, a, I've got a, a select query that goes into a database. How do I, how do I start mocking that? Um, do I have a test mode for all my calls? When I'm going to call this in test mode, then by the way, use this mock object, or, or how do you how do you do that? Well, uh, well, it, d it depends on which level you are testing. So if you are testing that the logic of your query is correct, then yes, you need to you need a database because well, w you want to check that the qu this query on this database works well. Uh, but uh, if you if Usually what you do is, yes, you write a query and then you write an abstraction layer on top of it. So at some point, uh, you wha wha what you get is an, uh, is an API which, which says, like, uh, uh, give me all the persons uh, which, which have this characteristic. And then, and then all the code which calls this API can call a, a fake object in which you just, well, you just implement this method and you return a 42. Well, and then you check that you, you, you return uh, 42 or something. But uh, the, the, this is really, I mean, you, 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 you test in layer, basically. You start from, from the bottom, and then all the upper layer can use fake objects to, to avoid uh, well, reusing the actual implementation for the bottom ones. Great. Any thoughts? Um, just time for one more question over there. Hello. Uh, how important is the speed of the tests for to to make TDD practical, and how long roughly should the entire test suit take for for TDD to remain practical as well, just in total? Right. Uh, so uh, a good uh, uh, this is something which I didn't write in the slide, but yes, one property of a good test is that it should be fast, and then and and in. Uh, in a hypothetical world, uh, you, your, your entire test suite is very fast to execute so that you can execute it, uh, the whole test suite, uh, at each commit. Uh, if it takes one hour, well, you, wo you just won't, because you cannot uh, wait one hour for, uh, mm, for waiting for the test result. And, but, that if but then it becomes hard, because uh, depending on what, what, is what your code is doing and uh, how it's tested and uh, how many tests you have, then it it happens that um, it takes a, long, a lot of time. So for example, for PyPy, running the whole test suite takes two hours, three hours, something like this. So we just don't. We, we, when you execute uh, some, when you modify some code, you execute like, for example, all the tests in this directory. 
and then uh, you re we rely on a nightly build bot to run all the other tests. So uh, every day we check if we introduced any mm, regression, and uh, and then yes, you can use for example all HGBsect to find which commits um, broke this particular test and etc. This is not ideal. In the uh, the, uh, the ideal uh, um, way would be that you run everything every uh, every time, but but sometimes just not possible. Th th this is also one way, uh, one of the reasons why it's a good idea to not to test the code on the actual database, because if you start to do query on the actual database and you have to recreate it every time or uh, recreate the tables, then it becomes much slower. If you have a fake object which does in memory, it's faster, so all the other tests become faster wel as well, so you can run more, basically. All right. Um, thank you very much, Antonio.